Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation on engine monitoring tips for efficiency and preventive engine maintenance. My name is Jeff Simon. I'm president of Social Flight. For those of you joining us for the first time, Social Flight is the free web and mobile app dedicated to supporting general aviation. Visit socialflight.com or download the free Social Flight mobile app for Apple and Android devices and you get free access to over 10,000 aviation events, destinations, airport, restaurants. You even get a weekly email with a list of all of the aviation events happening in your local area. Our mission is to give pilots like you more reasons to get out there and fly. That's what we're all about. And now in addition to events you can fly to, we have online events which is why we're all here this evening. Now, before we get started, here are just a few tips. First of all, a recording of tonight's presentation will be available on socialflight.com and also on our Social Flight YouTube channel within usually about 24 hours. So by tomorrow night, you can expect to be able to go to YouTube and search for Social Flight and be able to see a recording of tonight's presentation. Also, we do have the ability of trying to address as many questions as possible that you have during tonight's presentation. There is a questions section that is built in to the webinar tool. If you post those questions, uh, Stephen or myself will do our best to incorporate those changes, uh, those questions and get you some answers in the presentation itself. We're not gonna actually have a separate Q&A at the end, but we will give you a contact uh, so that you can ask all those specific questions to your aircraft, your situation, or your question, specifically to Bendix King, and someone can get back to you personally and make sure that they're answering it exactly what you need for your aircraft. Um, so with that, let's get started with tonight's presentation. Quick background, uh, first of all, on myself. I'll be joined tonight with uh, ben, uh, with Bendix King and with Stephen Pierce, but a little bit about me so you know who's talking to you. And that is, um, if, if you're not already familiar, uh, I'm an AMP, an IA mechanic. I've been in the avionics industry for over 20 years, pilot and aircraft owner. Uh, bottom line is I absolutely love aircraft. I love aircraft. I love uh, being able to teach about them and talk to people about them. And my uh, my email, my phone is always open for anyone who'd like to follow up with me. I am also the maintenance columnist for AOPA's online and I'm very, very passionate about uh, helping people get involved in their own maintenance on aircraft. In addition to that, I've spent quite a bit of time working with the FAA as uh, an STC holder and PMA uh, holder for a variety of different products, including Beechcraft Extended Baggage, Flex Alert, Multifunction Enunciator, and much, much more. But as we said before, we're really right now about what we can do to get more of you flying and teach you about your aircraft through social flight, et cetera. And we're going to give you a little sneak peek into another project we're doing where we're building a T-51 Mustang in our living room. So yeah, you'll actually see a picture of that a little later on. Now I am very, very fortunate to be joined tonight by Stephen Pierce. Um, Stephen, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah, so my name is Stephen Pierce, uh, UND graduate, um, aviation technology management, and I do hold my commercial multi-engine instrument rating, uh, which I got through the university up there. I'm very excited just to be part of the social flight webinar and uh, being able to help Jeff out on uh, these webinars. I am, if anybody is on Beach Talk, Pilots of America, Piper Form, Mooney, Space, um, most of the forums out there, um, the Bendix King voice that you're seeing is me. So if you do have any questions and you uh, want to go through a form for uh, maybe an answer or a question that might have uh, a lot of people may need, feel free to reach out to me on any one of those. Um, I'll definitely do my best to answer that stuff. Um, I have written some articles uh, for uh, some publications in Europe, uh, working on some stuff here as well. But in general, I really just love airplanes and I love flying them and everything about aerospace in general. So um, let's get this uh, ball rolling here and let's uh, talk about some engine monitors. 
And so just a quick overview of what we're looking at today. Uh, we're going to talk about some of our Bendix King solutions up front, um, our AeroPoint engine monitors and uh, the EIS system on our AeroView Touch, which is that new primary flight display. If you are at Oshkosh, that was front and center in our booth. Um, we're going to kind of walk through some of the features uh, of the AeroPoint set itself. Uh, and that's going to be mainly handled by myself uh, up front. And then uh, in the back half, which is what the meat and bones of this is going to be, uh, Jeff and I are going to cover uh, the installation and customization of those units. We're going to talk about um, how those can be mounted, uh, what the displays can look like where we can get the data, how to download that data. And Jeff is gonna talk about um, obviously rich of peak, lean of peak operations, things along those lines. And then at the end, like we did talk about is just contact information. So my information is gonna be there. Uh, so definitely feel free to reach out, give me an email. I'll do my best to answer those right away. If not, we'll make sure that I get you in touch with somebody who does have that product knowledge to get some of the more technical questions taken care of for you. Um, so moving on, I just wanted to hit this right up front. Um, there's really no secret that Benix King has been partnering with some industry leaders. And uh, for our engine monitors, that partner is going to be JPI. Uh, so we have adopted kind of a best of breed mentality uh, because we know that a lot of people don't just fly with uh, one manufacturer in their airplane. There's a lot of folks that make a lot of great instrumentation out on the marketplace, and we want to be able to incorporate incorporate that into a full vision of your panel and try and help you get all that stuff working together in a very integrated way. And so by bringing in JPI as a partner, what that allows us to do is make sure that our products and JPI's products have a really, really strong integration uh, with each other and moving forward. And the goal for that is to make sure that we can get some faster development um, in some of this stuff, specifically on the EIS side when it comes to displays. And we can talk about that here in the next slide, which is the AeroView Touch display. Um, and that actually utilizes the JPI DAU, the data acquisition unit, is what we're using as a central integration point for that system. Now, the software that's on the actual AeroView Touch itself, that's being built by Benix King um, and our software engineers, but the data integration tool, that's actually a DAU that's built by JPI, and we're using that existing cabling and everything like that to pull in that EIS data to a PFD display so we can make sure that we're starting to get some of those pieces in your cockpit integrated. And this is one way that I can show you that that sort of partnership is actually working for the integration piece because we're actually already have that. And I can show you these are actual screens here that are engine data that it is being integrated with the DAU. So uh, in terms of the integration portion, I think that's really exciting that we can show that that sort of development with those partnerships is something that's already happening. And uh, I think that just benefits everybody in the industry overall. But um, we'll focus on just the individual pieces as we go through. So we're going to start talking with the X point. Uh, this is the experimental uh, solution that we offer for engine indicators. Um, super high resolution, re resolution display. And uh, the cool thing about this is it's going to come standard with your EGT and CHT, but it's kind of like a, an a la carte option from a restaurant. It's going to allow you to save money by excluding options that you don't necessarily need for your airplane. And you can essentially essentially pick and choose what indicators that you want. Do you need fuel flow? Do you need anything else in regards to that? Do we need turbine inlet temperature for your fuel? Do we need fuel pressure, oil pressure? Is that something that you have maybe on a standard gauge you aren't looking to integrate? All that kind of stuff, we're able to keep that cost down for you by keeping those options as options and allowing you to build out a really, really nice unit. And so on the next slide here, we can actually talk about 
uh, and look at some of these options. So everything from an RPM sensor all the way down to a remote alarm light, um, if you have any sort of indications that go out of a normal operating range, there is a remote alarm light that you can add to that package that you can have front and center just in case something goes off, that alarm light will uh, illuminate and you can go ahead and look at that in more detail to determine your course of action. But you can see that there's quite a few options there and for a lot of people, they may not need all of them. And so that's why we're having them as options to keep that cost down, build an a la carte model, uh, which is really cool to kind of tailor towards your mission exactly what you're looking for. And then next up, uh, is going to be our AeroPoint 200, which is, this is a certified primary engine data management system. And so I'm talking STC, TSO, unit. The nice thing about this is the flexibility with its mounting. Uh, we have the ability to mount, mount it in landscape or portrait mode, depending on what you have in terms of your panel configuration, the space, the kind of look and feel you want. And when we talk about uh, this unit later on in the presentation, you'll actually see that the display itself, uh, we have it displayed in landscape here, but is actually gonna change for what you see, um, how the RPM and the manifold pressure, how those look in landscape versus portrait. And that's gonna be a part of you picking what you personally like, a look and feel, and how that's gonna work in your airplane if the landscape or the portrait mode is gonna be better for what you're looking at. Now, this is entirely configurable. The screen here, the linear bar graphs, um, all that kind of data is gonna be configurable for what you need. And so you're gonna have options on how you want that the bar graphs to display, um, things along those lines. And we're gonna talk about how to set that up for your mission later in the presentation. And then, like I said, um, these units do automatically warn you when any parameter is exceeded. You are going to see um, text start flashing angrily red at you if anything is exceeded a normal limit with those bar graphs on the linear side or anything along those lines. So it's a very intuitive way for anything goes red, you can immediately start drilling down to nail down a problem if there is anything. But obviously the biggest thing by integrating all your older gauges into a single engine monitor is we're gonna start to increase um, some of your maintenance times. So we're gonna give you a better option when it comes to doing maintenance rather than anything reactive, which potentially you may have been doing. We're gonna start giving you data analytic trends that are gonna come from these so we can start doing preventative maintenance to help try and decrease some of those engine costs, which is a huge thing. And then not to mention, these units do have an, automate, an automate, uh, automated lean assist mode. And so that's gonna allow you to lean. These are set up for rich of peak already. Um, now, if you do want lean of peak, you can definitely go ahead and do that. But we recommend that you have balanced injectors if you do go to a lean of peak operation. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind when we do have these units. And then when we move to the flagship unit here, this is for any of the twin folks that are gonna be on the call. And this is the AeroPoint 300. So once again, this is a single primary flight instrument, um, TSO'd, STC'd for twin engine aircraft. And so you can even see here on the display that you do have a left and right manifold pressure, a left and right RPM, and to display everything, effectively dual. Now, the cool thing about this unit itself is the wires that run back to this unit, it's not just a mess or an absolute mouse nest back of your panel, there's two wires. So all of the wiring on this unit are collected on individual data acquisition units and then pulled in from those. So the wiring is really easy. What that's gonna allow you to do and 
your shop to do is we're going to cut back on some of that installation time by using those DAUs to pull all that data in and then simplify that wiring when it comes into your cockpit. So that's a big time saver. What that also it what that also allows us to do is to collect a ton of data for these units. And so when we talk about data and we do have options and whatever you want, um, everything is going to be standard on these units. But when it comes to your fuel flow, this is especially where this unit is going to excel. So it's going to give you a huge amount of fuel flow options, whether or not you're going to have uh, your fuel flow. We have total amount consumed, total amount remaining, um, automatically calculates the percent horsepower um, on this unit as well, uh, which you can actually see here. Um, on the manifold pressure screen, just under the large blue numbers there, it actually calculates a percent horsepower. Um, and so that's a pretty cool thing, especially in your, if you're flying in high density altitude areas or anything like that, it gives you a, an idea of what your engine is operating when it comes to the actual power that you can um, get from that. Now to go through some of the options on the AeroPoint 200 and 300, this is just a sampling of a couple of the options that we have here. Now there are a lot more, um, but like we said, this is for a multi-engine airplane. So we're going to allow turbine inlet temperatures, one or two of those, fuel pressure, non-turboed or turboed, uh, fuel pressure for the turbocharger there as well and pressure for the carburetor. So you can see that these, once again, very customizable for what you want to display in your aircraft, allowing you to really fly the way that you want to fly and see the data that matters to you when it comes to flying your airplane. And that's the big thing that we're kind of going for is just giving you that sort of flexibility with these displays to fly like the way that you want to. We can move to the next one here. And so this is where we're going to let Jeff take over for a little bit and uh, talk to his uh, A36 since he is flying very similar unit here. Thanks, Steve. So, um, yeah, and, and I really wanted to say, obviously, I, you're going to find two things. Uh, one, obviously, I am a huge proponent of engine monitors and how it changes how you actually fly the aircraft. And I'm going to give you some tips about that. We're going to go into operation configuration and, and, and a bunch of different things, including how to diagnose what you're seeing, which is a very, very important thing. And the other thing is most of what I'm going to present to you, just so that you know, has reference material that you can find even in the pilot's manual. So you don't have to worry. There'll be a recording of this, but you don't have to actually worry about, um, you know, am I, how else am I going to get some of the information as it goes by fairly quickly? Now, this is our uh, A36 Bonanza, which has a unit right there in the center. You can see the first thing that uh, will jump out of you, this is our current unit that we have today is a non-primary unit. And there's some key differences between doing a primary unit and a non-primary unit. If you go with something like the experimental, of course, that doesn't, uh, you know, that can, can do either in an experimental aircraft. But uh, the uh, AeroPoint 200 and 300 units are primary replacements. That's what they chose during their integration and partnership with JPI. One of the advantages, of course, is that some of the dials you see here in our aircraft aren't going to be present when we do our upgrade over to the primary one. You don't have to have uh, a mechanical manifold pressure, fuel flow, et cetera, and, um, and of course, the other mandatory instruments for fuel level, oil pressure, amps, oil temperature, uh, et cetera. It's a pretty important uh, and very, really great benefit when you can get rid of that. And so we're looking very much forward to being able to do that because we've already put money into fixing our manifold pressure gauge in the past. But I wanted to see what we have and where we're going with it. The other thing about this picture is this, uh, we actually mounted this flush, and there's a flush mount kit available that will actually uh, show you how that, how that works. Now, that's great if you have to fly a certified aircraft, but we have a pretty cool project going on. And uh, if I were to look behind me right now, this is the site that I would see in our, uh, our kind of office slash living room space, which is a Titan T-51D Mustang that is hanging out here with its tail almost up to the ceiling 
and the entire aircraft here. This fuselage is getting built right in our house. It is it is a ton of fun. If you go on YouTube, you can see all the videos of our build and how we're doing it. We have guest builders and lots of information about what's going on with this. And we are really excited because we are uh, have designed the installation to uh, accompany the X.100. And it's interesting because it shows the flexibility of that unit. So the Titan 251 Mustang that we're building has does, doesn't have an air-cooled engine, right? The Mustang was a water-cooled engine, of course, with a big radiator and the scoop in the belly. And we are using an LS3 V8 engine that's a, a over 300 horsepower uh, engine that's part of what Titan sells as part of their firewall forward package. Well, in that case, you've got very different parameters that you've got to deal with. You still need manifold pressure. You still need RPM, of course. But now we need to think of different things because cylinder head temperatures and EGTs aren't our issue. Now we need to be thinking of coolant temperature, oil temperature, uh, oil pressure, uh, all the things that go along with that. And with different options available, we're going to be able to measure and manage all of it in this one three and a half by three and a half inch unit, which also matters because it is a very tight panel in the aircraft. So we're getting experience in both these aircraft. That's where some of the, uh, the information that I'll talk to you about, uh, about comes from. Now, when we talk about mounting, you have two options. First of all, uh, all the instruments use uh, what we can think of as, as a can that's coming in the back that is sized to go into a standard instrument hole. And what's nice about its design is it's offset. And that offset matters because it actually allows you to figure out based on where your, your instruments or where your holes already are, if you are putting this in an existing panel, where you've got some free space to extend the screen. And that's key. So uh, that may drive where what orientation you put it in, and it can support all those different orientations. Now, if you are uh, comfortable and it does make sense for you to cut a rectangular hole in the panel, well, then a flush mount kit's available, and you can see it right there, and that allows you to recess it when you're doing that installation. And that decision doesn't actually have to be made right up front. I flew for quite a while with it uh, just surface mounted, before I finally took the time to go cut the hole, make the mountings, and, and put it in there uh, the right way. And those two different buttons that you see there, um, one is black, one is white. In this one, and the primaries, you've got additional buttons that let you get more direct access to some of the features. I'll show you that. Um, but what's interesting is you can pop those caps right off and make sure that the one that you're going for is, it fits the orientation that you've set up. So you can actually configure that as well. Really, really flexible. Talk about installation. Um, now, we're going to start with something that you'll hear more than once, and that is some measurements, uh, most measurements of an engine that you're going to do are uh, absolute measurements. What is, this, what is the temperature of the cylinder? Well, it's, this is the temperature at the probe, and that it's, a, it's a number we care about very much, especially since there are red line limits for a cylinder, et cetera. EGT, however, is a relative instrument. If for EGT, or exhaust gas temperature, we're using this for diagnostics. We're using this to figure out how to lean our engine, how to tell what's going on, how to see if there's an issue or something like that happening. The key point during your installation, when you put your EGT probes in, is not so much that they are exactly uh, at, at the, it, you know, there's a, spec, a, a distance you're supposed to put in according to the manual uh, from the actual um, flange on the exhaust uh, stack there, but what matters most is that all of them are equal. Because ultimately, that's what you're trying to kind of see as, a, as something that makes sense to you, that makes the most sense. If you have one that's much higher up, you're going to get an EGT much higher on that cylinder than one that's lower. Now, EGTs are never going to be the same for every cylinder, but we at least want them to be close enough to be very useful and not a distraction. So when you do it, make sure that you are paying very close attention or your installer is paying very close attention to how that's getting put on. And a little tip, when you go and you mark and you drill through your exhaust stack, 
never ever do it with a lead pencil. Lead will create a hot spot, even if you're drilling most of it away, any residual will create a hot spot and could sharply degrade the life of your exhaust stack. Um, now, Steve mentioned remote fuel alarms, remote temp fault alarms, those are all things that you can have outside the unit. The unit itself does a great job of alerting and telling you what that what you need to look for. However, um, it really helps to have data, especially alerts, up front and center in your panel. Now, uh, the example that you have here, this is our Flex Alert uh, 100 unit, and this has dis distinct alerts, not just for your gear that you see, but you can see there in the upper left, engine, oil pressure, fuel information. You can use this with any of the Bendix King units as an external enunciator if you choose to. You can also use any LED light or other standard incandescent light or get the light directly from them. However, it best fits your panel, but in some cases, it really does help to have a remote alert that is front and center that tells you to look down. And of course, goes without saying this last point, anything you do about installation really should be in accordance with advisory circulars here from the FAA for proper installation. This does not change when you're doing an experimental aircraft. Same thing, same thing holds. May not be completely legal, but your inspector is going to check it out anyway. And the bottom line is they are great, great practices for proper use. Talked about orientation. Now, Steve made an, an interesting comment earlier. So he said, you know, different information is present when you change the orientation. He is absolutely right. So the first thing is, as is shown here, you can have it vertical, you can have it landscape, you can, you know, choose to have an option for manifold pressure and RPM, you can choose not to, uh, at least in the experimental side. And what those choices do is change that orientation. So what I would encourage you to do as you're laying out your panel is make sure you're actually looking at what does it translate into. If you are comfortable, uh, if you think, hey, I could go either way, but I really like this portrait view, great. But understand that your RPM is going to be on top, your manifold pressure is going to be on the bottom, or vice versa, because during setup, you have the ability to reverse those. Same thing on if you want them left and right, I happen to prefer it that way myself, then you have the ability, which one's on the left, which one's on the right. Same concept there. And again, um, it, it's, it's, just a, it's just a different way of looking at things. But there's something else too, and that is that when you have those layouts, it actually changes how much space you have on the screen for your linear fields. So it actually affects how much data you can, you can do. So in some cases, you may choose to lay out your panel differently because in a landscape orientation, you're going to get more linear fields at any given time to see. So just consider that as you're, as you're laying out where you're going to go in the, in the panel itself. Talk about linear gauges. So two different things. During everything that I say, we're going to have to be balancing two things. We're going to be balancing the discussion of using the X.100 in an experimental aircraft like our Mustang, where you have lots and lots of options available to you, and you can put whatever you want on the screen, and also the primary gauges of the uh, 200 and the 300 units, where due to certification, and because they are replacements of a primary, you don't have quite the same options. If you're, you, if you're installing something to replace primary instruments, they are going to have to be displayed all the time. Now, you can change the order. You can change kind of how and where they're displayed, but they're always going to be there. And I'll kind of refer back and forth to what some of the key differences are when you actually do this. So linear gauges, you've got voltage, EGT, shock cooling. Now, that's more optional, right? Um, EGT span, same thing, not as, as critical. It's like your, your span between your biggest and your smallest. We'll talk later about why that matters uh, and how you interpret it. But that's not primary when we think about it. Oil temperature, oil pressure, outside air temperature, fuel flow, fuel used remaining and required to destination. Now, if you look at the message area, I'm going to go right back up. This bottom section here that currently says EGT and CHT, 
and you can see it on the bottom here. You can see it on the landscape one right there. Those big numbers, those big numbers rotate. And that's why in that other one in the lower right-hand corner, you actually see gallons per hour. All of your parameters rotate through the message area. And you can set how you want that to go. So there's some interesting options that you have in how that data cycles through there. And so you may want to leave your linear instruments focused on the things that you absolutely need to look at all the time and open up your message area uh, to be able to rotate through things that you don't aren't as concerned with. You can control the frequency that those go by. You can control things that are excluded from it. And during installation, you can even put a, an external switch in that changes whether or not you are going to rifle through everything that's in your included list or just fuel parameters, if that's what you're focused on, which is quite frankly how I fly quite a bit. What's my gallons per hour? What's remaining? All that. That's rifling through because when it comes to temps, uh, especially CHT and EGT, I'm focused on the data that's actually on the bars, seeing what's happening on the readouts, and then the linear gauges are always there. But the key here, flexibility, talk to your installer and make sure that it, it, you have a panel plan that fits what your options are actually for you. Now, what are some other things that you can customize? Well, if you are dealing with the X.100 and you're dealing with an experimental, you can choose all the alarms for yourself. You can choose that at, even though your, your limit is 2700, let's say, on your RPM, that if you go up to 2710, you don't want an alarm going off. So you can choose to set that something to, uh, you know, 2710. Um, you can choose to set different things for your uh, cylinder temps before they alert. Uh, lots of different things are completely within your control. However, on a certified replacement for primary gauges, you can imagine there's some limitations there. And those limitations are there that they have to come from the factory pre-programmed and non-changeable with what the red line numbers are for that aircraft in all those different categories. You can't change that. But nice option is this concept of pre-alarms. So you might be surprised that a lot of the limits that are actually existing might not be numbers you're really comfortable with. The CHT limit out of the factory is, at rough, I think they're usually 450 degrees. I don't know many people that are thrilled about running their cylinders at 450 degrees. You may want a pre-alarm that goes off at 400. And that's something that you can set yourself and be able to, to manage and adjust based on what you've been seeing. So it's not annoying, but it gives you what you need to make a flight adjustment as you, as you proceed. Another one down the list here is horsepower constant. So even though you, you have a unit and it comes preset for your aircraft, there's three things we're going to talk about that you need to be able to adjust. The first one, manifold pressure setting. It's built in, it sees it, it knows it, but ultimately you have to make adjustments to it if you want it to be as accurate as possible. There's a procedure you as a pilot can go through and make sure that the manifold pressure with the engine off at sea level or at your airport uh, altitude, um, that you get that so it's right in line. That matters so that your manifold pressure is reading correctly and in sync with the instrument that it came from. The next is a horsepower constant. So Stephen mentioned earlier that we've got this really great number that's presented on all of these screens that says, hey, here's your percent horsepower. If I look at this one in the upper left, it says 72% horsepower. So how do we know exactly what that is? Well, it comes to you from the factory with essentially the best setting that makes sense for it. But there's a process that's in the manual for you as a pilot to go through that has you looking at the charts for your aircraft. What RPM, at what altitude, at what performance, like what equals 75% how you go through that. And it actually has you fly that profile to that and then adjust what's called a horsepower constant to make sure that the number you're getting is accurate and that it then gets adjusted up or down 
so that what you what what should be 75% power that you're getting out of that air engine at that flight profile is exactly what's reflected uh, on the unit. And then after at that point, the Bendix King unit will actually start sending you uh, differences from that that are that are even more accurate than you actually get directly when it comes out of the box. Another area of customization is fuel tank setup. That includes the limits and pre-alarms. And, and then we're going to talk about something called K-factor in a minute that has to do with customizing your fuel flow. But let's start with your fuel tank setup. Um, many general aviation aircraft uh, have a, a variety of differences. So you've got, you've got a few different things. First of all, let's say you've got a very simple setup on your fuel tanks. Um, in the simplest one, then of course you've got one or two tanks and all you've got is the, the you know up to the top but most aircraft have a way of delineating some easily visually measured distance down for a lower amount and that's very similar to what you're getting here like to the fill it to the tabs don't fill it to the top we all know this kind of stuff and so your first thing that you can do in setting things up is to actually tell the unit that you have two tanks even if it's for for one tank you say up to the tabs is the equivalent of one and then from the tabs up is the equivalent we break up a single tank into multiple tanks depending on the levels and what what the whole purpose of doing that is that when you hit fill the tanks after you've filled up it's really really simple if you've set it up well the unit simply says to you, oh, did you essentially, it's going to say, fill to this number? No, fill to this number. It'll give you the two options and you don't have to play games with it. And so therefore, it's really simple that uh, I know I do that with the tabs in the Bonanza. We just sit there and say the tabs are 10 down each, hold 74 usable gallons. And so literally it's like, did you fill it to 54 or did you fill it to 74? And I can do that in, in two button pushes and, and delineate that difference. Now, if you have additional tanks, it has options for that as well. And those are obviously real tank situations. And um, so there's, there's a number of different ways for your particular aircraft, um, you know, follow up with Bendix King and they can help you understand what the options are for each your unique aircraft. The key here though, is a lot of times when people just drop off an aircraft and say, hey, install the engine monitor, and then they come back, the shop hasn't gone and done this. This is stuff you can do, and, and that's really helpful. Um, I've also given you an example here of what some of the default, this is, this is not for every aircraft, this is just some examples, um, of what the default limits for low and high are and when you might want to put an example on. And some of these examples are different from what I actually tend to do. You look at CHT, no low, no low limit on that uh, by default, but a high limit of 450, that's the default. And uh, you might say, well, I want an alarm at 465. Mm, not me, I want an alarm at 400. <laughs> so it depends what, what everybody's doing. Uh, you can choose in many cases to, if it's the certified unit that you're getting as a primary, you can choose to set pre-alarms that are below the numbers that you see here. Uh, your monitor will come with giving you what all these settings are, and then you can, you can work to, for it to make sense. There are certain cases where if your aircraft has been modified or there's something else that's a little bit different, you can also work with Bendix King to have limits changed um, and even some orders of some, uh, some what's displayed change as long as it still meets the criteria for primary just work with them separately when you order if you need something and it can be done afterwards it's just done on a, a configuration file that's created so um, uh, a lot of options can be done but uh, it is key that first and foremost what what matters here is what is illegal as a primary if you're using a primary unit second if it's something different for your aircraft of what's legal, you can you can often do that. So these are a, a number of different options that you have here. Let's talk about the next one. And this is the one you're probably going to spend the most time with in your aircraft. It's K-factor tuning. 
So what is K factor? Well, if you take a, when you do an installation, you're going to have a fuel flow transducer. That's a, that is a unit that uh, goes in line with the fuel flow going into the, the uh, engine itself, either going into the carburetor, going into the uh, fuel, um, the flow diverter. Um, either way, you've got this transducer that's really a tiny little spinning wheel inside and measures all the fuel that goes by. You would think that these are absolutely, you know, like perfectly tuned units to uh, uh, to the aircraft and are right off the top of the bat. However, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Now, when you get one of these, it's going to have a number on it. That number is going to be the K factor of the transducer as it was tested. Each one gets tested for flow and for its output and gets a number associated with it. And that's what gets programmed into the unit as your K factor. And that is essentially a correction number to let you know what is the fuel flow that's going into your engine, and then you see it. Now, every aircraft has different differences in terms of, could be uh, the plumbing, it could be the, the rate or the pressures, it could be a, any number of things that go on there. Generally, the K factor that you get is gonna be pretty good uh, right out of the bat. and what is up to you is to refine it through experience and experimentation to get better than pretty good, to get really, really accurate in a way that you're really happy with. And so you might find that, let's say, uh, I mean, I just went through this process. So let's say that um, you start out of the box and I'm burning through, you know, over 50 gallons, 50, 60 gallons. And at the end, when I go and I measure, uh, I go and I, I top off, I do the flight, I burn the 50, 60 gallons, I um, uh, cry about the bill, and then uh, when I've uh, come to my senses, I go and uh, actually measure how much fuel did I put in and what does the Bendix King engine monitor say <laughs> that I burned in the and how close are those amounts? And you may find that they are uh, just under one gallon different between what it says and what what actually was. It isn't too bad over a 60 gallon burn. However, by going through, they have you do three different runs, all of which should be long runs. Like it's not going to help you. You're going to have way too much error if you go and you burn five gallons and try to go through this process. You want to burn your tanks substantially down. Do that three times. Measure in the left column what your fuel used is shown on the monitor. In the right column, what your actual fuel used is. And then you take what your current K factor, what your unit was shipped with, or what you last adjusted it to, and use this formula. The new K factor is the amount of fuel used times the K factor divided by the actual fuel used. Boom, you've got a new number. It is easy to put into the system. Uh, it's hard enough that it doesn't happen accidentally, but it is easy enough for you to do. And then you go again and you do this process a few times until you've really, really tuned it in. And I strongly recommend to all of you as you go through this process to make sure that you are writing it down. And there's a place in your user manual, in your pilot's guide for the monitor to write this down. Because the last thing you want to do is somehow get to a situation where the unit has to get it repaired or anything else, the number's lost, and you've lost all this work you did. Um, so make sure you keep it. Now, talk about some operational tips. There is not, uh, I'm gonna say this now, I'm gonna say when we get to Lena Peak operations too, we unfortunately do not actually have enough time this evening to go into all the details of how to do things. We will uh, perhaps have a follow-up where we get into some more details. So I'm just going to give you some highlights, some things that are really important to know about it, not really just a kind of teaching about, uh, about just the highlights. You can see this diagram to know what things are, but here's some keys. The first thing is that the normal mode that you are going to see, CHTs and EGTs, that normal mode is basically a percentage based on what the maximum expected is for each one and then where they are percentage-wise for maximum. In other words, 
what's the CHT versus the scale kind of percentage wise when you look at it? You see 450, 400, 200, and then you have the same with your EGTs. If you press and hold the lean find button, what happens is your unit goes into something called normalized mode. Normalized mode means they all go level, everything goes level. We look at it and say, we consider the current bar graphs as they are now to be normal. And we put them, every one of these bar graphs at halfway up. And then what you're going to see are changes. And that's very, very important to use during stages such as run-up and diagnostics. Because the key there is you're looking for changes. You're looking to see that one cylinder really dropped off. And that's a lot harder to see if you are looking at gauges where it's normal for one of your cylinders to have a much higher EGT than another. Um, that's completely normal. You're going to have certain cylinders that don't get the right cooling, certain cylinders that get different amounts of fuel. Like All of that is going to cause you to see an, a, an irregular, and I hate to use the word regular, but not a flat level of bars that are in front of you and you need to take that out if you're going to spot trends and issues and so you press that lean and you hold that lean button and it goes into normalized mode when it's in that normalized mode now now you go through you do that by the way once you're at your static rpm for running up put it in a normalized mode at that point now do your mag check now you can see a big change in one versus another because you're actually seeing compared to where it was as the as the change we'll we'll go through some diagnostics but that's a key trick to use the other thing you can use that in flight but don't change your power or you're going to have to reset and go back to normalized mode once you've started to change your power um all bets are off you've you've totally uh, thrown a wrench into the whole concept of normalizing Steven mentioned uh, the fact that these units have automated rich of peak and lean of peak functions. And that is just, uh, I'll tell you, there's two reasons to have an engine monitor. One is diagnostics of everything going on in your engine, which is just, just critical. And the second is the ability to intelligently and safely fly either rich of peak or lean of peak, but to do it properly in a way that's not putting your engine in danger and your wallet and yourself, depending on the situation. And so either mode can be accessed very, very simply on the front of the display. You push a button, it switches from Richard Peak to Lena Peak. We're going to talk a little bit tonight about Lena Peak and Richard Peak. But the key here is that the unit does it automatically. And when you go and start leaning, you put it in the mode, you hit the LF button, and then you put it in the mode, and it automatically starts going through watching the EGTs, watching them rise, detecting the peak, watching them go back down. And it's, it's a very, very simple thing. It's just key that you do it the right way. You should be going about 25 degrees per second um, when, you, when you do that. I, I tend to give it just a slow, gradual turn as I get through it. Um, uh, but uh, you can learn a lot. Uh, as you do that, and it'll kind of show you that. And then what will happen is, as soon as it detects that, it's always going to be blinking, and all of a sudden it'll start blinking. See that box that uh, on the right-hand side one, it says uh, number one. On the left-hand side one, it says number three. It's going to be blinking, and then it's going to identify which one uh, peaked. And so when you think about it, Leaning is the concept, right, of you, you have an ideal fuel-air mixture that's going into, uh, that you want for combustion going into a cylinder, an ideal fuel-air mixture that's going to happen. And when you go through and go through the, that uh, leaning process, you are giving it excess fuel and then slowly taking the fuel percentage away until you reach the ideal percentage, and then you are going to either move back up in a rich of peak operation and give it more fuel than is ideal until you get to the point that is safe to fly and most uh, and proper to, to be operating the engine or continue to lean in a lean of peak situation until you have l less fuel than is ideal until you get to the point that is 
exactly what you, what and how you want to operate that. That's the basic concept. Now, I will tell you right off the top that the entire concept of proper engine operation, lean of peak operations, rich of peak operations, understanding gammy spreads and all of this stuff is, is stuff that can take up an enormous amount of time. I am fans of the folks over at Advanced Pilot Seminars. Um, they are actually uh, the same folks that are over at Gammy and Tornado Alley uh, Turbos. Um, they're just, they just don't exist people that understand engines and, and pre-ignition and detonation and proper operation and efficiency beyond these guys, hands down. Um, and their course, if you really want to learn this stuff, is a two and a half day, full days each time course uh, that gets into all the details um, of all of this. So I can't put two and a half days of education um, into two slides, but I can at least give you hopefully a little bit to go on that will help you. And the key is you can't even begin this process until you've got a great engine monitor behind you to start doing it. So first of all, Operational tips. Regardless of, of where you are, these are curves that you can kind of see here. And, and what they show you is that as you go from full rich backwards, your EGTs continue to rise. That, that means what's happening. So exhaust gas temperature. Exhaust gas temperature is the temperature that's coming directly out of the exhaust post combustion. Hopefully. Hopefully you don't have a lot of combustion happening after that point, which can also raise EGTs. And as you get more and more towards that ideal point, that number goes up. It goes up differently for every one of the cylinders because they're not perfect. You have a little bit different fuel and air that's reaching each cylinder. And you try to get them as close together with balanced fuel injectors. You can get balanced fuel injectors on new engines from uh, Continental Motors. You can get balanced fuel injectors on any engine by working with the folks over at GAMI. And your goal is to be able to take them up through the best power range to the best economy range, et cetera. Talk in a minute about why you don't just hang out at peak. But the bottom line is you've got these ranges that you can operate based on your flight manual. And those give you percent power, specific fuel consumption. It's a, it's a fascinating area that I would encourage every pilot to get really, really educated about. And it has risks because at the bottom, uh, the bottom line is if you choose to be ignorant about where you want to fly and you just put the mixture knob wherever you want to at high power, you can really cause damage. You can cause detonation. You can cause um, pre-ignition to occur, things like that. Um, it's a it's a pretty pretty big deal. Now, Advanced Pilots puts out this chart as an example, and this happens to be a chart that actually works for the Continental engines, uh, the 550 and 520 series. Um, and this gives them an example because what they do is they put this thing. You see this kind of a red area that comes down. Uh, forms a point right around 7,500 feet, and goes down both sides. They're calling that their red box of stay completely out and away from that area. And the reason that they're doing that is because, it, it, in a nutshell, if you go to the basics of engine operation, just just even skim the surface here, when you really look to what happens, um, fuel doesn't isn't meant to and, and should not explode. It's actually a controlled burn from each spark plug. The reason you lose power when you go to one mag versus the other is because we've got these big bore cylinders on aircraft engines. And you ignite this ideal fuel mixture in both places and the fuel, uh, the, the burn propagates from both sources in controlled, balanced, and efficient for this large area and then puts pressure down on the, the peak pressure down on the piston to give you that work at exactly the time you want. It doesn't happen in an instant. It builds, it puts additional pressure. What actually happens, a lot of people think that that spark plug goes off, that that burn starts when you're already pushing down. 
That's actually not what happens. What actually happens is because of the time it takes for this process to happen, that ignition happens while you're still in the process of a piston moving up. Um, many of us, have, uh, you've heard the term, like, what's your timing? It's a, you know, 28 uh, or 22 degrees before top dead center. What you're setting with those magnetos is when that spark starts before that piston's all the way up. So before it's even time to start pushing down, like the pedal of a bike, you need that process to start burning that uh, fuel before then. And so that's why it's before top dead center. You're compressing all of that fuel air mixture. You get the ignition. It finally reaches peak pressure. And you want it to reach peak pressure when you're already pretty far down. Imagine yourself pedaling a bicycle. The last thing you want is while your knee is, is at its highest point, for that to be where most of your muscle power is coming, that would destroy your knee. What you really want is for it to start building and reach the maximum work that you can expend to put towards that bicycle or towards that piston to come when your knee is just the right place that it is designed to take it and is getting the most amount of workout. And that's exactly what proper timing does. And the other thing that happens as part of this is the how that fuel mixture is set, that affects that as well. That fuel mixture affects how quick the burn happens, where the burn happens, et cetera. And so that is why, in a really simplified way, that is why when one of the reasons that we take a chart like this and we say that if you are going to run either Richard Peak or Lena Peak, you need at these altitudes at full power, wide open throttle, this is where you need to be compared to peak that it is not safe to be operating your engine at peak until your altitude, in this example, is above 8,500. That's because you don't have the power available anymore to actually damage the engine. You can now run it all the way through the scale. You're not going to hurt yourself. But when you get below those numbers, and it gets a lot, you can see this box gets a lot narrower, like 6,000 or 5,000. But when you're really low, you have to be very concerned about that. And so when you do pull back, you want to pull back smoothly, and you want to get to where you can actually run. This, could be, this one shows big mixture pull. We're at like 4,500. We don't go really, really, really slow through the danger zone when we know that what we're actually trying to get to is, in this case, let's say minus 40 or something like that, um, which puts you in that ideal range. And basically, you're just looking between this dark green and light green area on this chart. You're basically looking at what you, what you want to trade off. You want to trade off fuel for speed uh, safely uh, and be efficient. It's actually in this area. Now, again, I cannot give enough credit to advanced pilot seminars. So I'm not trying to take their place. Um, this, this is just a a, uh, a little bit of a peek into why it's so important and what you can actually do. You can make a massive change in the amount of fuel that you burn in the speed of your aircraft and of its overall efficiency by understanding how this works. So I definitely encourage you. Now we're getting a little tight on time, so I'm going to move out of this because again, I, I could talk about this until the same time tomorrow night. Let's talk about diagnostics at this point. So we're going to switch gears. We're going to say, You've got this engine monitor. What is it we can learn from it? What happens when you see different things? And the good thing is these charts are actually available in the pilot manual. So when you see some of these things, you don't have to go back to the presentation. You can see it there. But we'll explain some of them. First of all, let's assume that while you're flying, you start seeing an EGT rise in one cylinder. Single cylinder, your EGT starts to go up, starts to go up. You're seeing this number climb. What in the world is going on? Okay, well, what does that mean? So, CHT, cylinder head temperature, is what happens when the burn is, you know, the heat is coming out through the cylinder itself in normal burning proper operation. You see normal CHTs running. Exhaust gas temperature can be affected by both the efficiency of that, but also if you're starting the burn 
but it's really not even remotely completing by the time that a mixture of fuel and air starts exiting the exhaust, it's still burning at that time. You're not just taking exhaust gases out. You're taking a process that is currently burning and putting that out through the exhaust. Well, that happens when a spark plug stops firing. Filing a wire problem, if you are, if you've only, if you're not efficiently uh, uh, doing what it needs to do from two spark plugs and getting enough to get that burn going, it's going to start happening further down the path, and that's going to show up as a high EGT. Sometimes you'll see a little bit lower CHT with that as well. If you go to the next one, if you see an EGT increase or decrease after ignition system maintenance, so now someone's gone in, we've put new mags in, let's say. Or it's an annual, mag timing was checked and changed. All of a sudden we see an EGT increase compared to what we're used to seeing. What does that mean? Same thing. We could have uh, retarded that timing. What that means is that the timing is happening later than it used to. Or we could have advanced it and now all of a sudden it's, you're getting lower EGTs. It's telling you that the timing's not what it was. And you really need to just make sure, was it done properly? Which was wrong? Because some things changed. So which was wrong? Did you go in there and your timing was wrong? Your mechanic says, hey, we found out your timing wasn't set right, so we set it correctly. Then you would expect to see this change. Otherwise, you wouldn't. Next one, loss of EGT for one cylinder and the engine gets rough. All of a sudden, we're not seeing. Our EGT is off the, the scale, um, things like that. We could have an issue with a stuck valve, let's say. Um, that's that's the biggest thing that could cause that um, because you, you, you're really not not getting uh, the burn that you need at all, not getting the compression that you need. And um, and so you could have a problem with EGT going down right there. Um, one of the nice things is that there are built-in diagnostics for probes. When you go and you add something, let's say you start and then you go back to Bandix scanning, you get an option added. Um, the system automatically recognizes it, automatically says, new probe found. And it automatically knows when it can't find one of its probes. And so if you see this next message, you know that we've got a problem with probes. You can start, you can swap them, you can help figure it out that way. Um, next one down uh, is a decrease in EGT for one cylinder. So we talked about increase in EGT for one cylinder. What if we've got a decrease all of a sudden that's happening for uh, EGT in one cylinder? Well, in that case, it could be that we're not actually getting the combustion. That means the combustion certainly isn't extending into the exhaust uh, system, but it's actually not happening enough. And so it could be that the intake valve isn't opening enough, there's something going on with the lifters, whatever it is, we're not getting enough to, to have that uh, uh, prep, uh, that uh, thing. And you want to look also at your CHDs and see what's happening there uh, to know whether it's uh, something like that or it has more to do with fuel. Um, and if we're just talking about low RPMs, sometimes that can be low compression. Um, EGT and CHTs being really non-uniform. Now, you first need to know what's normal for your aircraft because, again, they're not going to really be totally together, but they shouldn't be as far apart as this example, that's for sure. And that can happen when you start to get valve plugs or injectors in different cylinders. When something's going on and you've got real uniformity issues, that's where you go to injectors and plugs. Um, and then if everything, if you're, if you're seeing across the board, decreases in something like EGT and we didn't come out of maintenance, we're not looking at something having to do with how the timing was set up, well, then we need to think we're, maybe we're not getting enough air into the cylinder. So we want to check that as well um, to see if that could be the problem. And, you know, there's times that you can also check and see if that has to do with not getting enough fuel as well. Um, if you slowly start to see rise in EGT, there's things you want to look at your your exhaust valves. If you're getting like EGT is going slowly higher each progressive flight, more and more on the EGT. What that means again is that you're not containing the actual combustion event. And ex, uh, exhaust valves are notorious when they fail for kind of happening this way. You just when you've got a good seal, because that's what it is. An exhaust valve seals off your combustion chamber. When you've got a good seal there then everything's great and it all burns, you know, inside. You don't have to worry about anything until the valve opens. The minute you get a little bit of a, of a problem with your exhaust valve, 
something gets stuck in there. Um, it gets a little erosion. Whatever it is, you get this pinhole area that the flame, the heated gases in the flame, essentially is able to escape that cylinder during the combustion event. That operates like a blowtorch. This tiny little thing will burn and expand and expand the same way that a little leak in a dike would. Um, and that is what you want to look for with a slow rise in your EGTs. A little bit of burning will just start going more and more. And if you will watch it, it doesn't happen in one flight. You want to watch it over days or weeks. That's when you want to scope your cylinder with a borescope and take a look at that valve. And you'll see heat signatures. You'll see problems right on the face of the valve. It'll change colors. You get to see where that leaking is happening, and that does not heal itself. It just gets, the minute you've got a leak, it'll just get worse and worse and worse because it is so hot and so corrosive and so destructive in that area. Um, moving on high CHT on cylinders, on maybe only on one side of the engine. Now, of course, <laughs> it, it pays that if someone were to quiz you and say, you know, which, which cylinders are 135 and which are, you know, 246 on your engine, that you know these. <laughs> but uh, since they generally alternate, if you start to see a pattern like that, you better think bird's nest, number one. <laughs> if you've got a bird's nest on one side or something like that, you're going to see this, this alternating pattern on your screen, and it means that you've got a problem cooling cylinders on one side of your engine. Um, Moving to the next two items, anything you see that is sudden, rapid, uh, you need to think pre-ignition or detonation, full rich, reduce power, um, immediately protect that engine. It is a runaway condition that happens when things get so hot under such pressure and the mixture is set in such a way that all of a sudden you start exploding the fuel instead of burning the fuel in a controlled burn. It, it is very destructive. It can tear apart an engine. It can tear apart a cylinder. Um, in, a, in a car detonation, we think of as pinging, and the computer senses it, and it's no big deal. In a plane with these huge cylinders and without the things that automatically detect it, it's a big, big deal. So you look for something to spike, and the minute something spikes, you go full rich and reduce power. Uh, immediately, and then check the rest of it after you land. And a few more that we've got here. Um, again, we talked the, the top ones we already talked about. Basically, they refer up above uh, things that can happen with detonation uh, things. Now, magnetos can also cause some of that. Um, but um, if you've got uh, full throttle causing EGTs to rise, you could have problems with your fuel pump, and and um, if you start seeing a, uh, a, CG, a CHT, excuse me, that um, uh, that's that's just really just going off the charts. A lot of times, remember that you're dealing with a big hunk of metal in a cylinder. Things don't happen fast, uh, with the exception of detonation or something uh, else that could be happening, and that is could be a leak in your exhaust system. A leak in your exhaust system in, is coming right near where that probe is on most cylinders and it takes nothing for all of a sudden it to go boom and and you see no egt change but um all of a sudden your chg just starts skyrocketing that could be that could be the cause of it uh, right then and and also you start seeing things in the last one large different at low rpms if you're starting to see big 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 differences in things then you should you should get a compression check and see uh, and see what's happening there Last part uh, of our presentation, we'll talk a little bit about data download and analysis. Um, these, which are, you are not expected to, I, I could not get a screenshot anyone could read because there's just too much stuff on every one of these. But uh, the software that's used is called Easy Trends. It's free, and it comes with anytime you get one of the Bendix King engine monitors, you're going to be able to download the data anytime you want and display it in Easy Trends. One of the best features for this. Uh, aside from for your own knowledge, is you can send this to any expert, and just about everyone out there in the field knows how to uh, has Easy Trends knows how to read uh, your engine monitor output and help you. If your mechanic doesn't know how to read engine uh, monitor output like this and help you out, then uh, consider a new uh, mechanic. Um, it starts with two reports. There's really three types of reports that come out. The first is a main report. That's going to have all your EGTs, all your exhaust gas temperatures coming out of each cylinder. 
and it's going to have all your cylinder head, uh, your cylinder temperatures. And that's the main thing that you're going to look at. And you can uh, zoom in, you can move them around so that you can get a good sense of it. And really, this is this is real. This comes off of one of my flights, and it shows you know all those start to go up as the power goes up, and then I go and I start leaning, and you see them come back down through that, and then level off after I went through the leaning. Um, but that's your main report. The next one that you have here is um, uh, the options report. And on the options report, these are all the other options that you have that you can look at. These are really, really helpful. Oil temperature, outside air temperature, fuel flow, hor uh, horsepower, RPM, manifold pressure, battery. I used this recently when I was trying to hunt down a, a problem with a, either battery or voltage uh, regulator. It turned out to be a, a solenoid problem. And it was uh, something where it was a great tool to see what is happening with my battery output throughout the flight. So all your options are available here. And it's very, very, very helpful to see that as well. And then here, uh, this is a, a lean find report. This is great, uh, especially if you are either considering or already uh, a customer with balanced fuel injectors. Um, it lets you go and go through that lean process, and it will actually do an analysis on it. So this is showing you in blue the uh, decreasing fuel flow as I leaned back and seeing what's happening with peak of each cylinder and then each one comes down as I continue to lean that back. So you're seeing that fuel flow and it will actually automatically give me what's known as, uh, well, for, for GAMI, as the GAMI spread. Um, it'll actually give you what is the fuel flow difference between the first cylinder that peaks and starts to go down, and the last cylinder that peaks and starts to go down. And what that means is, the so the first cylinder that as you slowly dial the mixture back that peaks, that's going to be your leanest cylinder. That from the get-go, that was getting the least amount of fuel. And now you've taken enough away that it reached its ideal point, and now it's starting to not have enough fuel compared to the air mixture to have an ideal burn, and it starts to have lower gas temperatures coming out as the burn gets less and less ideal. The last cylinder to go through that process, well, that was the richest one. That was the one that had the most excess fuel to start with. And then as you go through this, it leans and it starts to come down. So uh, you go through that process and you're able to determine what is the spread between your richest cylinder and your leanest cylinder um, or in this case, vice versa, your leanest cylinder and your richest cylinder. And by doing that, you can refine, uh, you can change out the injectors, get them as tight as possible. Uh, should be less than half a gallon per hour between the first one to peak, your leanest, and your richest, your last one to peak. And why that matters is because that's what lets you go further lean of peak without with a smooth running engine. Um, the biggest reason that you, it's really hard to do this type of thing with a um, uh, with a carbureted engine is because with a carbureted engine, right, we just, you know, suck a bunch of uh, fuel into the air as it's going by through the carburetor, and then we send this mist through turning pipes of different lengths to each cylinder input, and you don't have a lot of precision in the fuel-air mixture that's getting each cylinder. So each one's a little different. Uh, some of, uh, and, and so, you know, some are getting a, a wet mixture, if you want to think of it that way, and some are getting a dry one. And so, um, really hard to get that in a carbureted engine. At least in a fuel injected engine, we have, uh, the air coming in, which may be different, but we can match it with a sized injector at each cylinder that meets what, uh, matches what we find through experimentation is coming in uh, to each cylinder. And that's how you tune your engine to getting it as tight as possible and being able to do whatever you want, rich of peak, lean of peak, and having lots of options with a smooth, efficient running engine to you. So the bottom line is we have lots of data. Um, this has been a lot of stuff. We're hoping that we can follow up with uh, perhaps another one at some point in time in the future. I hope this was valuable, even though quite a bit of it was um, kind of drinking from a fire hose uh to <laughs> a little bit um but uh, hopefully this really helps you i am passionate in my uh beliefs about engine monitors uh, i can't imagine flying 
uh, without one, with the it, it, with the exception of just being in a situation between something that's just as simple as possible, carbureted engine, maybe a simple, small engine of not producing much. Even then, I would love to know what's going on because when the engine starts making noise, when something doesn't seem right, your answer is often in front of you right while you are airborne. So with that, I am going to hand it back over to Steve for a quick review of this and, and thank you all for, uh, for my role in tonight's presentation. Yeah, and thank you again, Jeff. Uh, this was definitely a learning experience for me as he walked uh, through some of that stuff. I learned a lot. Uh, Rich of Peak and Lean of Peak stuff, working with Jeff throughout this entire presentation, so I really appreciate that. But just a quick recap, um, the goal of kind of what we're doing with our engine monitors is to integrate those into the future with Benix King products. Um, with all of the options available across our engine monitoring lineup, most of these are gonna be able to go on your aircraft. There is gonna be some option for your airplane. Let us know, let us know what you need so we can get you set up. Um, in regards to that, we do have mounting, uh, multiple mounting options for panel space, orientation, what you like to look at, all that sort of stuff. And then most screens can always be customized for what you guys need. There is that automated Lean of Peak, Rich of Peak um, on all the units. Um, so utilize that and then utilize the data. Um, that's what's going to matter long term for your engines uh, and for uh, the longevity of that kind of stuff. So start looking at that. Do some prevent preventative maintenance. Get that stuff to your AMPs. Let them look at that so we can all help in the troubleshooting aspect of that and moving forward. So once again, I really appreciate everybody for staying on the line. I apologize that we did go a little over here. Um, but on the next slide here, there is my email. Uh, so if you do have any questions, um, I'll give you a couple seconds here to write that down please feel free to give me an email, um, anything. I'll make sure that those get um, routed to the appropriate people if I can't answer them or anything along those lines. So once again, thank you so much for your time and uh, for joining us this evening to talk about engine monitors and uh, how to use them. So I appreciate that. Thanks, Steve. Definitely appreciate it. Uh, again, uh, any questions I can answer directly there. Uh, which is a, a very, very helpful. And another thing to uh, also keep in mind, again, a lot of this information, when you get your unit from Bendix King, it comes with that. So if you're concerned about those charts of what does it mean when something, uh, when we went through all those different symptoms and what they can mean, um, that's, that's going to be right there in the guide. Um, and, and certainly that can, that can help you. The experts at Bendix King can help you. And, um, you know, we're, we're certainly here for you, and feel free to reach out at any given time. Tonight's presentation is a part of Social Flight's webinar series. We've had a number in the past, and we will have many, many more to come, especially featuring Bendix King, their products, and all sorts of different special areas that we can learn about the aircraft that we fly, avionics, and management for the most efficient uh, way possible. But at the end of the day, we all want to get out there. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. Get out there and fly. Check out Social Flight. Find your next adventure and destination. And please join us for our next one here. So blue skies to everyone. Take care. Good night.